Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us virtually. Uh, we had planned to have this outside uh, so that we could see everyone's faces, but the weather wasn't very cooperative. So thanks for joining us. What we wanted to do tonight uh, was to let you know about the things that we saw, the people that we loved, uh, and the conditions that we saw on the ground in Haiti uh, this year, uh, February of 2020. It, uh, I was reminded that it was indeed this year just now. Uh, it seems so long ago, um, but that's what we're here to do. Um, so if you will, uh, I'll open us with a small prayer. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I'm thankful tonight that you are our Lord. In good times and bad, you are God. I ask tonight that you send your spirit, that you be with us here physically in the sanctuary, that you be with all of those who are listening by Zoom. I ask that you use our time together tonight to educate all of those in the world who are interested about things that are happening in Haiti and the ways that we can help. All of this we ask in his name, amen. All right, so um, to get going, uh, I'll have Christy come and join us and tell us a little bit about the history of Haiti. Hello. I wish we could see everyone. We're so excited to for us to be in the same room. Ready? Ah. Uh, so I hope this finds you well. We're excited about sharing um, Haiti to kind of take our minds away from what's happening here in the States and focus on some great things that are happening in Haiti and to also reflect on some beautiful things that happened on our trips in the past. So I'm going to give you a quick history of um, the island of Haiti, the where it's, where it's located where we actually um, are when we go on our mission trips and kind of a little history of how Haiti got to be where it is now, um, economically and um, politically. So this first map is the way Haiti first appeared as it was part of the entire island of Hispaniola. And the joke is that as Napoleon landed on one side, on the western side of Hispaniola, and Christopher Columbus landed on the other, they had a race. And where they ended was the boundary between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Obviously, Napoleon had short little legs because Haiti does not take up as much space geographically as the Dominican. But Haiti and, um, and the Spanish were obviously very different in the way they uh, ruled their country, except that they imported slaves. And so at the time, Haiti immediately overthrew the, the native people there and started importing slaves from African countries. And these slaves went immediately to work. So this is about 1625. And at that time, they were exporting every natural resource that Haiti had. For it, uh, the fact is that all of the gold that's in the Palace of Versailles came from Haiti. At this time, they were importing slaves to have a ratio of 10 to 1, 10 slaves to one French-speaking slave master. And this language was mixed together. They divided the slaves so that they couldn't speak the same language. And the slaves started learning how to blend their native language with the French tongue. And that is how Creole became the language of Haiti. It was adopted as the, language, the national language in 1965. Let's back up a little bit. Haiti became the first uh, enslaved country to proclaim its independence. This happened 15 years after the 1776 revolution in our own country. There was an inspiration that happened there. Um, if you go back and, and really Google and look at the relationship between Haiti and the American Revolution, it's amazing and it's tied together. Um, at that time, there was a conch that was blown, there was a revolt, and the slaves took over Haiti. It sounds like a great story, except it took 30 years for them actually to declare the freedom. And the way they had to do that was come up with 21, equivalent to today's $21 billion dollars so that they could ensure that France would not invade uh, Haiti again and take them uh, back over. This is a debt that has taken 122 years to pay off and it has, was not fully paid off until 1947. This is kind of where, when people say, why is Haiti so poor? This is the beginning of the poverty infliction on Haiti. So what is really cool about Haiti is that we have been able to go into an area, we'll flip to the next slide, 
And the northern part of Haiti is where we are in Cap Haitian. You'll see it on uh, the northern end of Haiti there. This area is where Street Hearts is. The history of Haiti runs through as a prideful country. They have, have the, some of the worst odds and worst uh, economic um, dep depravity than anybody else because of this $22 billion debt. Right now, Haitians make an annual income of $350 per capita, an annual, that's an annual income. What's great about Street Hearts is that we're coming in and um, being able to help these, uh, the kids of Street Hearts have a better future. And um, we're gonna introduce the next video that is of Haiti, I mean, of Street Hearts, and we'll give you a great history of, um, of what Street Hearts is doing against all of these um, really tough odds that Haiti has uh, encountered. Keep in mind, it's a country of pride, it's a country of beauty, and uh, as Street Hearts in this video is gonna show you, it is definitely a country of hope. World News. Life on the streets anywhere is dangerous, especially for children. In Haiti, it's deadly. Caitlin Buck traveled to the island nation to see how one woman is providing a safe haven for the street children of Cap Haitian caring for not only their physical needs, but spiritual needs as well. Each morning, Lindsay Jorgensen wonders if the street children of Cap Haitian will choose the refuge she offers or try to survive on their own. The first thing I do is pray, um, because you need God to be able to do this job. Lindsay is the founder of Street Hearts, an organization born from a bond with the kids who captured her heart. The streets of Haiti are no place for a child, but because of poverty, abusive situations, or simply having no family, that's where many of them end up. They're forced into adulthood at five, six, seven years old. And the longer they're on the street, the harder it is to reverse their mentality or to come in and, and try to help guide them because at that point they've already been so wronged that they feel like they know everything and everybody's against them. Lindsay first connected with the street children of Haiti in 2012. She would literally run across them on her daily jogs along the boulevard. She soon discovered they shared something in common. It was kind of like, I definitely stuck out and I was the odd person in town and they are also in their way the odd ones left out in their communities. They didn't have anyone, I didn't have anyone, and we just started hanging out. By earning their trust, she heard their stories. I was six when I was in the street. I had a friend named Zama, and he was on the streets with me. And I was in the street with my friend Zama, and some of the street guys came and wanted to cut us with a blade. Everywhere I went to go to sleep, they came and followed us with that razor blade. Guys used to come and beat us and take money from us. Money we collected begging in the street. Heavy sexual abuse, um, kids as young as seven engaged in sexual acts with men for food. That's why Lindsay started Street Hearts. Her mission, create a safe haven for boys living on the streets of Haiti. The ministry recently realized it had an even bigger calling due to an increase in street violence. One thing we've seen recently is child sacrifice, um, and that is due to the voodoo here, that a voodoo doctor would come and for whatever reason someone would pay to steal a child's soul. So then they kill the child, they basically stone him to death, um, and then they take the soul of the child Oftentimes, they'll take their teeth or something, and then they do a spell, and that soul gives whoever that wants it power and influence. That evil led Street Hearts to offer what's called Phase 1. Kids who aren't ready to fully leave the streets can catch a Tap Tap or Haitian taxi that will take them to the Street Hearts shelter. They receive a meal, shower, and clean bed for the night. Then they officially join the program and move into a bigger shelter. A street heart team works with each boy, teaching responsibility, discipline, and respect. Most importantly, they learn they are somebody and they're loved. We serve as father figures to them, and we use that as medical treatment in their lives. Patience, love, more patience, and some more love. You just got to be patient with them. Most likely they'll come along. Lindsay feels a daily struggle between the weight of her work and the normalcy of it all. 
You never know what's going to happen. You don't know if a child's going to die that day, who's going to be sick. And then on top of that, you're dealing with basically the day-to-day -day mom stuff, which is school, soccer practice, this one's got this issue. Um, one kid wants you to see his art project, running errands everywhere. And it's not, you know, two children, it's 75. Phase three helps those over 18 focus on workforce development. The Street Hearts team finds partners to take on the kids as interns. The progress can be slow, transforming a hardened adult in the body of a six-year-old back into a child takes time. It's imperative that you take a step back from time to time to just look at them and see how far they've come, whether it's in their mannerisms, the way they dress, how they represent themselves, getting report cards. One of our most troubled kids is the president of his entire school. Jorgensen says that above all, her hope for these children is that she will see them in heaven. That is so important for me. When I die, and I pray that I die before them, I cannot see one more kid die. I want to just sit at the gate and wait and watch them all come in. And so she presses on, relentlessly seeking the boys she hasn't yet been able to reach. The kids know that every night the tap tap will come, but it's still up to them whether they accept the help or stay on the streets. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Cap Patient, Haiti. I'm going to send it on over to Miss Laura. She's going to tell you guys how we became a partner with Street Hearts. The third time was the charm for First Presbyterian Church to establish a partnership in Haiti. Uh, we had met many people along the way. And one was Alan Yarber, who told us, uh, you'll know what you want to do. You'll know what your partnership is when you have a passion. And it was November uh, 15, uh, 2017, when we went to Street Hearts. And we had Cindy Correll, one of the mission workers, had told us about Street Hearts. And so we set up a meeting that afternoon. And we had taken beads to make necklaces and bracelets with the boys. And of course, we were thinking, what are these boys going to want to do about making necklaces? But let me tell you, they loved it. They loved the interaction with us and the adults. And we felt a passion. It was there. So um, we got so excited about it. We were met by Francis, who is a really, we would call him the group coordinator. And as soon as we set foot in there that afternoon, uh, he was just made us feel so at ease, he spoke English, and it just made it easy for all of us. So uh, upon returning to the United States, we got in touch with Lindsay uh, Jorgensen, who is the executive director. And as you know, the rest is history. But uh, the mission of Street Hearts spoke to all of us uh, at First Presbyterian Church uh, to empower homeless youth and transform communities through the love of Jesus. This is exactly what we were looking for in a partnership, and we felt it there at Street Hearts. Um, our church has generously given uh, to this mission and this ministry. Uh, as you know, Lindsay would send us a needs list, and our suitcases were overflowing with the goods that we took to Haiti, not with what we wore on our back. So anyway, it was just a great opportunity for our church to uh, reach out to our brothers and sisters in Haiti through the love of Jesus at First Presbyterian Church. Thank you. I'm Shannon Wright and my husband David, and we had the opportunity to go to Street Hearts the last two trips, um, 2019 and 2020. Um, when we wrapped up our visit in 2019, and we, stand, we were around with all the staff um, we were talking about all of our personal lives back in the States and so on and so forth. And out of at least six of our couples, we had over 200 um, years of marriage that spanned between us. And their staff and their culture was just amazed by this and shocked by this. And so um, Lindsay asked us to come back in 2020 and share about marriage enrichment. And that was one of our programs. And I think it, the thought was that if we helped enrich the staff, that it would then trickle down to the children of Street Hearts. Um, 
So we, not being, you know, counselors or whatever, we um, started with the book of five love languages by Gary Chapman. And um, it talks about the gifts. Um, the five love languages are receiving gifts, acts of service, um, quality time, uh, touch, and words of affirmation. And there is a quiz that you can take to see how you give love and how you receive love. And it's very, ben very beneficial for those around you to understand that um, and understand what you're doing for them. And that's how you're showing your love. And so we did this with the staff of Street Hearts and some of the older kids of Street Hearts. Um, we had them take the quiz and let them sort of um, think about that overnight and decide uh, what their actual love language was and how they like to give it and what they like to receive. So we took it from there and opened up for discussion and that went into all the um, scripture of marriage and Michael and David and um, a lot of the guys uh, spoke with the men and the women split off with the women and uh, we had great conversations about that. I'll let you talk about that. Well, when Lindsay asked us to come back the following year uh, in 2020 for a marriage enrichment um, process, we weren't sure what to expect or really how to approach it. And after much discussions uh, within our team meeting, we decided that we would just share our experiences initially, what our beliefs were as far as what a Christian marriage was, and then just kind of take it from there and let the Holy Spirit lead us. And that's what we did, and, and the Holy Spirit did lead us through through a very powerful uh, process with the with the Street Heart staff. Um, we started out, as Shannon mentioned, in a single session with both men and women, talking about the love languages, talking about um, our view of a Christian marriage. And then we split out. We split the men out and the women out, and so. Several of us were in on the men's side, and um, to say it was very interesting would be, um, would be, uh, it was it was more than that. Um, with all of our culture differences, um, it was very unique. They have no problem with multiple relationships, whether they're married or not. And so, our view with having a single relationship with a life partner was somewhat. Um, off their beaten path. And um, so we, we shared that, we listened to their thoughts and tried to answer their questions the best we could. Um, our goal was not to change their impressions of a, um, of a loving marriage or a loving relationship. We just sh shared ours and um, hopefully we were, we were planting seeds, which I, which I think we did. Um, well, I don't think everybody there agreed with everything that we said. I think that um, there was a lot of uh, thinking and scratching of heads of when we were through, especially when we got into the biblical side of things. Um, it got it got very interesting, quoting uh, scripture and um, trying to use that as the basis of what our our belief was. And so it was um, very interesting, very unique, very passionate. Uh, to see how, how they responded to, to our beliefs. So um, all in all, I think we had, we had a really good session. So okay. next, Laura Bailey is gonna come up and speak about impact attention. Hey, good evening. Um, I'm here to talk about Impact Adventure tonight. Um, this is a program that has grown out of Street Hearts um, as a way to employ uh, boys that are in the phase three of the program of Street Hearts and, and beyond. Um, it allows for these young men to uh, take groups that come in to work with Street Hearts on historical cultural uh, adventures throughout their beautiful uh, city of Capetian and surrounding areas. Um, and it's also a way that they allow for a field trip as a reward for younger boys that are in phase two. Um, 
I participated in these um, adventures for the last two trips um, in 2019 and 2020. You get to see some gorgeous parts of Capation. Um, they take you to places like Fort Nicolette. Um, this past year in February, we went to these beautiful waterfalls. And one of the memories, um, we also visited the Citadel, which is a huge um, historical landmark for Haiti. And what I would say is a lasting memory for me when I would go on these adventures with these boys um, from the very first time in 2019 and carried over into this year, um, you arrive at the place and the older uh, young men are fully in charge and they're so proud to show you where, um, where they live, these beautiful landmarks of their country. And the younger boys, they roll out of the vans and they immediately find a friend and it's, it's almost, it's hard to talk about in these days of COVID. They embrace you and they find a partner and you have an adopted child for the day that's going to lead you through the, the countryside and show you these grand um, buildings and landmarks um, and take care of you. And it's a perfect example of how uh, God wants us to be in relationship. You know, so many times we think about these uh, trips that we take for mission. It's about, I've got to go and do. And one of the things that I think the partnership with Street Hearts has taught me is that we are to be in relationship. And this is just as valuable or even more valuable than going and doing something. And we are growing and building our relationship with these children, with the leaders and impact, with the leaders that are guiding and growing these young men um, and our relationship with God. Um, and so that is a huge, huge blessing that I think. Um, when I think about the times that you have when you're in impact, you, the, the boys are leading you through these trips you are encouraged to speak English with them. Um, they're teaching you uh, uh, Creole and it's, it's just a beautiful um, experience to be in. So that is Impact Adventure. Uh, Tony Hubbard is gonna come up and talk to us about small business opportunities that is just another way that these young men are growing and learning how to be sustainable in um, Haiti. Thank you, Laura. Uh, and I am Tony Hubbard. And I've uh, been blessed to travel to Haiti twice. Uh, and I am here to discuss the Street Arts Small Business and Workforce Development Program. But, but first, I just want to share a little about my experience, and others will do the same. But to me, traveling to Haiti uh, is, is such a rewarding opportunity uh, for the mission team, for us, the ones that go to Haiti. Uh, it's an opportunity to show these kids, too, uh, that we care about them. We care about them enough to show up there in person, that uh, we confirm our love and support for them. And, and it's just very rewarding for us to, to do that. And uh, the love they, they show us is also I mean, it's extremely rewarding. But and really, but for Lindsay and Street Hearts, these children, uh, young boys, literally, in my opinion, they, they have little to no chance to reach any, much of any potential in life. So it's just a very rewarding opportunity. But again, I'm here to, uh, today to talk briefly about this uh, Street Hearts Small Business and Workforce Development Program. Uh, it's, it's an opportunity to give some of the boys a, a a job, an opportunity to learn about working and making a living, which is in, with the poverty and the limit of the high unemployment there, it's incredible the opportunity that this provides for them. And one such example of this is, is a taco truck. Uh, the University of Akron has, uh, which is another mission team that goes to Street Hearts, they have initiated uh, by donating funds uh, uh, for the truck and startup money, they've initiated this taco truck uh, program 
And the boys have started that program. Uh, they, they learned about preparing food. They learned about maintaining sufficient inventory. They learned about finances. Uh, they learned so much from this. Plus it just gives them a, a feeling of uh, importance to, uh, to be making a living and, and helping, helping uh, each other. But uh, in finances, speaking of that, you know, we, we as a uh, First Presbyterian, we taught a little class on finances and it's, it's great to see these kids, these young men, uh, take what we taught and apply it to a real life situation such as this small business that they've started. Uh, other ideas that we've considered are, are to import coffee. There's a, a local uh, cooperative of farmers uh, that grow coffee there in Haiti. Uh, and uh, we've thought about trying to uh, find a way to import that coffee to the United States, uh, to sell it at UPERC and other end users. Uh, uh, but, but, you know, we're always looking for creative people uh, to come up with other potential small business ideas for us to share with street hearts and these wonderful young men. And so uh, I just want to close by saying how much I thoroughly enjoyed uh, and received incredible blessings from my trips to Haiti and Street Hearts. And I hope that some of you who are there today are listening to this today uh, will consider traveling there with us to Haiti on our future trips to witness the, uh, the wonderful things that Street Hearts is doing for these young men. Uh, and now I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Michael Bailey and Beth Murray. They traveled with us to Haiti uh, this last time in February of 2020. And we're gonna let them share some of their uh, first impressions from that trip. I just wanna say how very thankful I am to have had the opportunity to go to Haiti and see street hearts in action. And I was asked to speak about my impressions um, as a first time. And what made the biggest impression on me and what I have drawn from many times since the trip um, is that you can feel their joy and see their faith and, and see the love for God written all over their faces. You can see it in the love that they express to each other, how they watch out for each other, how they don't let anyone go without. You can see it in their openness to welcome strangers and to share their world. And even in the midst of the challenges they face every day, you can see and feel it in the gratitude they have just for seeing another day. You also see it in the staff that pour their heart and soul into the street heart children. Um, and even through the daily challenges they face, they're not guaranteed a meal in Haiti always. They're not guaranteed power. It can go out for days at a time and they are still grateful and give thanks every day. Um, and Shannon and David talked a little bit about the marriage session and how it, our differences in those discussions um, were really apparent. And uh, we all, I think, giggled a little bit. And uh, while the men were speaking with the men, the First Presbyterian women went and spoke with the women staff members. And we talked about a, a lot of things, but um, we, we also talked about our children and our hopes for them and our worries for them. And um, through all that, we all felt very much the same. And um, that was my impression. And if you have the opportunity, um, this is one that everyone needs. Well, hello, uh, bonjour. Um, I remember one uh, morning, uh, Robin and I were talking and we realized that no one had prepared the devotion for that morning. And I said, oh, 
I've got something that I pull out of my back pocket. Uh, I'll, I'll pull it out right now. And I'm actually in the same situation right now because I'm not prepared for these, this, these remarks or this time because I was at another meeting. Um, but one thing, what I did that morning is I pulled out this devotional that has kind of a metaphor about how uh, difficulties and challenges in, in life, uh, oddly enough, prepare you uh, for real life and end up being a great blessing. They, uh, we, we talked about the, the metaphor of a, of a tree growing roots with, without a lot of water with difficult times um, uh, that forced a tree to, to have deeper roots and therefore the tree was stronger. One of the things that, that again and again, I go to Haiti and I meet these people, these children, these adults, and I think this person is so much stronger than I am. This person is so much more tied to their faith than I am. They are deep in their faith, deeper in their faith than I am. Um, and, and, and so the, we think we're going down there so we can fix problems or we can show them how to do. Man, that's so wrong. We're going down there to, to learn ourselves what the kingdom of God is really all about. Uh, I do hope that we can do some good while we're there, but I would definitely agree that just being in relationship uh, with them it, it is so much more uh, what these these trips are about, but those relationships do lead uh, to good to good work um, being done. I would say it's it's kingdom work. Um, so that's just a little bit about my impressions of um, of this trip. Um, and now I'm going to call upon the next person to speak. I don't know who that is, but I'm sure they will be riveting. That is a little video that 
the Street Heart organization sent out to us as a thank you for our time and um, our talents going down. But as Michael has already mentioned, um, they give a lot more to us than we feel like we have. We have a unique opportunity tonight to zoom in with Lindsay Jorgensen, the founder of Street Heart. And if our techno works well, she will be able to pull up. Um, right now, uh, unfortunately, there were some family issues and um, funerals she had to attend. But um, we were excited to be able to Zoom with her, and she's graciously given us some of her time. And um, we're hoping that um, she can help update us all on how things are in Haiti now, especially given that COVID has hit every country and um, how the boys are doing and how Street Hearts is doing amid the pandemic and any updates from there. So give us a second and we'll get her live, hopefully. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. that's better. Yes, we can oh. hear you. Can you speak really Yay. loud? I'm, it says my video is on. I can't see anybody. Can you guys see me? Yes, we can see you. Yes, we can see you. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I'm a loud talker, okay. so if anyone has any problems with volume, <laughs> let me know. I'll get louder. <laughs> we are so thankful you're with us, Lindsay. Thank you, Robin. Thank you all for having me. I know it might look a bit odd. I'm sitting here on the floor. I am in hub of COVID Fairfax Hospital here. Unfortunately, my dad is not doing well. Um, but I was able to step away and they told me I could sit in this corridor. However, you might hear some hustle and bustle of people walking by. I apologize in advance, but I just didn't want to miss this opportunity to talk with everyone and give an update on all that's been going on over in Haiti. So I'm going to start with an overview, kind of what's going on with Street Hearts specifically. After that, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Haiti in general, and then I'm gonna open it up to questions or anything else you guys would like to hear in more detail. I know there's a lot going on in the news about different things. So hopefully I address everyone's questions. As far as Street Hearts goes, I could not be more than pleased with the progress we've made. That video that was just sent, we will also send via email because I'm not sure if it actually went through or not. It was a bit um, challenging on my end. Um, but I really want you to see that those kids put that together themselves. We did not you know, direct or say you need to say this or that. And they did it as a thank you to all of us, including myself. And I had this dream nine years ago that I was just gonna open this teeny tiny little shelter so that kids had a clean place to take a bath and go to bed without having any fears. I never thought we would get to this place. And the staff has worked so hard and so have the kids to say that we have three fully running centers today, helping over 180, uh, 80, sorry, 153 kids and 87 kids in full-time education opportunities is just, I am mind blown. That is how you know it's all a God thing because no person could ever do that. Haiti is like the beyond wild west. Um, so it takes miracles. It takes God's hand in everything. It takes God touching the right people and bringing them all together. That's why we really don't refer to it as an organization often. It's more family um, because that is how we exist. We give each other grace. You know, we know there's going to be mistakes and just like everybody else, but today I can see, and what's even more special to me is because my mom passed away this year. And so I had to take four and a half months without being there, without seeing the kids. And that's the longest in nine years I've ever not been there. So my instant reaction is, oh my gosh, mom's gone. It's going to be a mess. And that truly is what I came back to just the centers were clean, everything was set up, the kids were happy and healthy, we didn't have any major disasters. That's such a proud moment for me as a business person. 
knowing that our administrative team is stellar, the teams running each center is stellar. Um, for me to see that the kids are happy and healthy, that's how you know you have the right people in place. Because kids will tell you. Kids are unfiltered. And if they, if they saw something that wasn't up, up on the up and up, they would let you know. So to me, that was just fantastic to see that the organization can run without me. Um, and that's, you know, I just really want to make sure to give them that credit. Our staff does not make a lot of money, um, but they pour their heart and soul. And a big part of that is because they focus on um, eternity living. What, like making the kingdom impact, not getting too bogged down into the nicer car, the nicer house, or my neighbor has this or that or whatever it is, but really focusing on your treasures in heaven. You know, what impact are you going to make? I think it also helps given that they lived in an impoverished country. Their tomorrow isn't secure. None of ours are, but especially for them, they do live for the day, excuse me. Um, and so their mentality is, how can I truly make an impact today on the future? Um, and I'm just, I'm just thrilled with them and the kids. The other big achievement is December, we will be having 16 graduates. 16! Biggest number we've ever had. This means that all 16 of those children are able to provide, provide for themselves through small business, are continuously promoting and like atten sorry, attending higher education, can live on their own, provide for themselves, and then in turn are making an impact on the community. 16 is the biggest number we've ever had. For those of you that met Jonky, T. Sony, um, Julio, that's the crowd, uh, Zamor, Fritzen, I, I just, Julian could not be more proud. That's what we've all been working to achieve. Number one, we want them to accept Jesus as their Lord. No matter, no matter amount of school or work or money, that really isn't the most important thing. We want to know that when we all die, we're all going to see each other again in paradise forever. Number two, though, is the ability to take a child that was sleeping in a box, afraid of having any type of intimacy or knowing what love truly means and is now living in a nice place on their own, paying it forward, impacting the community, reaching out, talking to kids, saying, I used to live like you, you don't need that life. The impact has just been awesome. I can't wait to see where it goes. I really think like we're just at the very beginning. Shall I go ahead and move into kind of the overall Haiti and then we'll do questions? Absolutely, sounds great. Okay, thanks. Um, as far as education is concerned, Haiti lost the entire year because August of last year is when the rioting started for the political season. So our kids had never gone to school. COVID was not around at this time. After February of this year, they announced they would finally open school. Our kids went for the last two weeks of February. And then March 1, all the doors closed and the airports closed for COVID to begin. So this is why you see kids going to school now. The Haiti government announced that, okay, we're going to open schools at the end of August and September. And then mid-October, they would take a test that those two months would represent, would represent the entire year's worth of school that they lost. As you can imagine, many people are very mad about that. School in Haiti, we pay roughly 450 US per child. That is not easy for the typical Haitian. So to have paid for the year, and then the child is going to try and learn a year's worth in a month and a half does not seem fair. And then in addition to that, the schools are asking now for us to pay for the following year. The following year starts November 1st. Well, so that would be like the start of this school year. So they're still missing 
months. They actually doubled the cost of school as well. So there is a lot of rioting projected to happen. We have be, been advised by our lawyers in Port-au-Prince and other people we know to not pay school for the upcoming year, which be, would be starting November 1st, to see if they actually open. In addition to that, the currency has done some dramatic changes, where when I left, one dollar was 100 US good, now one dollar is 50 good. That's quite a fluctuation, quite fast, and is causing a lot of crazy stuff for the economy. The third thing, starting November 1, is the new political season and when they start promoting for the president. The current president is saying he refuses to step down because he lost his last year of term because of COVID. So people are quite upset about that. So again, Haiti is a wild card. We don't know. The rumor mill is that there's gonna be a lot of rioting in November. Enough rioting so that the kids won't even be able to go to school because the schools won't open. If that is the case, we went ahead and decided that we would hire the teachers from the schools that our kids attend and they will be going to class in our centers. So that way our kids will not be using their, losing their educational year. However, they won't be able to go to the schools. They'll be taking class at our centers and we'll set up our centers to kind of re reflect that different rooms for the different ages and so on and so forth. Lastly, as far as COVID in Haiti, I'm not the best one to ask because I get so much mixed information. What I will tell you is what I can see with my own eyeballs, which is nobody cares. I don't see anyone wearing masks. I don't think, see anything closed. The only thing that I see that would follow the COVID rules are wearing a mask at the bank. You are required to wear a mask when you go into the bank, but nowhere else. Not the schools, not the restaurants, not the market on the street, which is open by the way, the airport in Port-au-Prince is open. International flights are functioning and flying in. Um, the airport in Cap Haitian is projected to open January of 2021, not before then. Am I missing anything? Haiti's always got a lot going on. <laughs> I think you covered quite a bit, Lindsay. Thank you for for that update and that report. Um, let's open it up to some questions in case anybody has any that's zooming in or anybody here. That would be great. Okay. Anybody on Zoom? I'm sorry, Blake's giving me cues. Um, if anybody is you know, tuning in via Zoom, do y'all have any questions for Lindsay or really for any of us who have been to Haiti this past year on our trip? Just, hey, Lindsay, this is Elizabeth Duran. How are you doing? Hey. Um, I just wanted to know what are y'all's biggest needs right now or how can we pray for you or support you right now? Um, our biggest need, which is always the hardest to say, but the reality is funding. Because of COVID hitting other countries so hard, we lost a lot of monthly donors. We don't even have half of our financial budget for school raised. I'm trying to meet with people as much as possible. I'm trying to reach out to partners. Um, I will say that First Prez will get more of a bulleted itemized list of needs. And then we figured they could share as they wish um, so people can see exactly kind of what projects uh, we really need help with. Thank you. You're welcome. Is that okay with everyone that I go ahead and default to sending out an itemized list so that you can see actual facts and figures? That'd be great. I feel like that just Any makes questions sense. for Lindsay? So, um, Sandy Stilson asked, um, for the most recent online fundraiser, um, 
are we prepared, do we know how much was raised? Yes, the, the most recent that I know of, and Lindsay, correct me if I'm wrong, was the um, Giving Tuesday Now campaign that happened in May, and we raised over $34,000 for Street Hearts. Not in our church. 38,000, yep. Once the fundraiser ended, we ended up getting two more donors because they leave it open and running till the end of the year, which I thought was very nice. So that was awesome. Our annual budget is just under 500,000. Uh, Lindsay, one of, the, one of the Zoom attendees is curious what a teacher's salary um, that has to be paid. Depending on their hours and you know, obviously higher education is a bit more expensive, but typically around 150 to 250 a month. Now being paid from the actual schools that's what they should be paying. I'm not sure they pay that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Hey, Lindsay. Hey. Um, well, prayers for you and your dad. Thank you. Um, I was wondering with the impact kids, I know they haven't had the groups like 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 the plan was. Um, kind of what are they up to? And do you have any groups kind of on the schedule to come down there? They're hanging in there. Street Hearts is continuing to pay them just because it's not their fault. And they've already committed to homes and are living on their own. So we're giving them a little stipend each month so that they're able to eat and keep going. Um, and we already pay for their schooling. Um, but they are a little depressed for sure. You know, they really love their jobs and they're excited to get back to work. Sadly, we have had no partners commit to 2021. As far as trips, you mean? As far as visiting, everyone's a little bit, and I understand that. The nerves of, well, what we don't know what we don't know yet, and what's 2021 20, going to look like, and the fact that the airport isn't even open yet. Um, we just really want to get people in to reserve the month, whether that works or not, so that we can tell the kids, you know, they, they do want to come and providing that everything is all in the up and up, we do have spots filled um, or reserved is the better word. But at the same time, I, I mean, I understand. Any other questions? Anybody here? Other questions? I have another really random question. <laughs> Um, okay, so when you go on Amazon, it gives you the option to, if you do smile.amazon.com, it gives you the option to select a nonprofit where a portion of your proceeds will go. And Street Hearts is on there. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to know if you actually see any substantial, like, is that something worth pushing or is it so minimal that not our efforts would be better directed elsewhere? Uh, the most we've seen from the smile side is $23. Typically it's around $7. Okay, noted. But every little bit counts. <laughs> <laughs> Any other general questions about Haiti, street hearts? Again, we really want you guys to get involved. This COVID stuff, it's got to go. We want to get you guys back down there. The impact trips, I mean, Emily, our volunteer stateside and the Haitian team did such a great job working and developing that. So I really want that to get back up and running. In the meantime, another way to get involved, which is on that sheet that you all will be getting up from Luann, um, is potential donation drives. So we are always in major need of clothes and t-shirts and t tennis shoes and soccer balls and soccer cleats. So we have a list of that if churches are willing to do drives because we've relied on our impact groups when they come down bringing donations. So having lost a year of that, that adds another weekly cost to the organization. Um, and, and, you know, we've, we've lost a lot of things like that. Yeah. Thanks, Lynn. Send that, send that over to us and um, we will all take a look at that. 
we will be praying for you and for Haiti and for your family. And we thank you for your time. I'm sorry that you had to do it in the corner on the floor, but we're so glad to see your face. Thank you. One last thing. I know it can sound a little bit hopeless as you hear me say like, we lost our groups. We have no clothes, et cetera, et cetera. The school situation, COVID as is Haiti, as is a third world. And that is why we're Christians. Let's all not get down in the dumps and say, oh my gosh, you know, it's going to go under or this or that and really step back and say, wow, watch God just do awesome miracles for all of us. And I mean, we'll get through this. We will get through this. God created this program. We did not. He is not going to let it go down. He has a perfect plan. It might not be our perfect plan, but I know his message right now is just faith. So please keep praying for us. The staff, the kids, myself for strength, perseverance, financial favor. If you can't provide a dollar and you can provide a prayer, you have no idea if your prayer is going to impact that another person to provide a dollar. So really everyone can do their part. Just wanted to end it on a positive. <laughs> Thanks for that. Well, we've got just a few more minutes. Let us close in prayer. And we thank you again, Lindsay, for taking your time, especially at this time um, that you've got so much going on. We appreciate you being with us tonight. Okay, thank you. All right. If y'all will, let's bow our heads. Dear Lord, we thank you for this church. We thank you for this opportunity that we had to go to Cap Haitian and to meet our brothers and sisters in Christ in Haiti. We thank you for Lindsay and for leading her to Haiti and for her ability and her willingness to listen to your call. Please continue to bless the boys of Street Heart, to bless the staff that is leading and guiding those boys and leading them to, to, towards you and towards your will. And we ask that you continue to be with the country of Haiti, especially during these times of potential um, unrest, and worry over school and the political situation. We ask that you be with our country at this time as well for many of these same exact reasons. As we are learning, we are all one and we all experience so many of the same things. And we thank you for bringing us together and for providing this amazing partnership between both Street Hearts and First Presbyterian Church. We give you the glory and we thank you for the many things that you've given us is in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, everybody, for joining in. Bye. Bye. Amen. Thank you. Bye.